as some of you guys have been asking, you guys wanted the full C. Bradley interview. And today we're here to do just that. We're finally releasing the hour long and certain amount of minutes long worth of interview. And please, if you like any similar content, go ahead and drop a like, hit subscribe, hit the bell, and also share this video. Because if you enjoy this video, why would you prevent any potential viewers from viewing this video as well? So make sure you subscribe and peace. The order and subordination observable in the physical, animal, and human world show that some are formed for higher, others for lower stations, the few to command, the many to obey. We conclude that about 19 out of every 20 individuals have a natural and inalienable right to be taken care of and protected, to have guardians, trustees, husbands, or masters. In other words, they have a natural and inalienable right to be slaves. That was a quote from George Fitzhugh to open us up. Um, and we're here with J C. Bradley Thompson, and we're going to have a discussion today about the ideas of the pro and anti-slavery arguments that set the whole context and framework for this for this big grand time in history that has a story with with much evil in it, but much heroism and great achievement. By the way, yeah. So again, uh, we're here with C. Bradley Thompson. Um, he's an executive director um, uh, for Clemson uh, Institute. Um, he's also a BBT researcher, um, gained his, uh, his PhD in Brown University. Um, and also, if you guys wish, uh, he has a lot of articles in, uh, at Substack. Um, let me look. Uh, Bradley, uh, C. Brad, C. Bradley Thompson .substack com, where you can find a lot of his articles at. Um, and um, I guess if you want to go ahead and continue um, and open up the floor to the context that we're about to say. Yes, so happy Father's Day, everybody. Happy Father's Day to you. Uh, Dr. Thompson, it's good to have you here. Great, um, thank you, thank you, Ibis. Uh, um, it's great to be here with with both you and Cudwe. Thank you. Um, well, to start us off, I think it's uh, most natural to start kind of uh, bring us into the story, uh, bring us into this overview of how we get to this revolutionary period, this revolutionary time. Yeah, so maybe we should begin in the present, right? Mm -hmm. Because this issue is being debated today um, uh, in the context of the 1619 Project, which was promoted uh, two summers ago by, by the New York Times, which made the claim that uh, America's true founding was not 1776, uh, and the Declaration of Independence, but rather America's true founding was in 1619 when first slaves were brought to the United States. And if that claim is true, that means then that the United States of America um, was founded in slavery. And if it was founded in slavery, that means it's immoral. And if it's immoral, then it is by definition evil. And so if you buy into that position, then it seems to me um, that you have no other choice, morally speaking, other than to bring down this nation or to fundamentally change uh, this country. So that's where we are today. That's the fundamental debate. And what's I think most interesting is that the debates today um, in many ways are a replay of the debates um, that took place, particularly, I would say, in the eight, between the 1830s up to the Civil War. And it was really a debate um, over the nature um, of liberty and slavery, a debate over the nature of the principles, um, the moral principles of the Declaration uh, of, of Independence, and, and then Politically speaking, it was it was obviously a debate about what to do with the institution of slavery. So the debate that we're having today, I mean, is really in many ways part and parcel of a uh, of a 250 year debate that we've been having um, uh, in, in this country. And so it really comes down to 
um, what's true, I think, and what's not true. So if, if we go back, let's say, to the 17th and 18th centuries, um, to, I think, get a fuller understanding and appreciation um, for what American revolutionaries and the founding fathers uh, faced in 1776, right? You have to understand that, yes, slavery existed in the United States beginning, um, it really it really only began in the sort of mid 17th century. Um, that's when slavery became institutionalized in, in the United States. And it was, an, it was an institution that existed largely, though not entirely, in the South. Now, two things have to be kept in mind here. The fact of the matter is, one, slavery at this point in the 17th century was possibly one of the oldest institutions that had ever existed in human history. There has always been slavery everywhere in the, around the world, right? And so in the context of the 17th century, when, when the first slaves were brought to uh, America, they were, of course, and this goes to the second point, they were brought to America, not by Americans, but by Europeans. They were brought to America by the colonizing nations of Europe. And there are, there are lots of social economic reasons to explain how and why slavery was established um, in, in uh, the American colonies. But the fact of the matter is, it is, it is illogical to suggest that the United States of America, the country, the United States of America, was founded on slavery, because that's simply not true. The fact of the matter is the United States of America was not founded until 1776. Now, I, I don't want to cut you off too long here to go off of this point, but it, it's from the conversations I've had with people, me and Cut, we've had one of these, uh, one of the things that seems to be working in people's head uh, right now is they they don't make a distinction between something you just said here, the difference between uh, Europeans and Americans. To a lot of people, the way the conversation and debate goes today, it seems like the two are the same thing. So uh, w were there any differences in ideas or, or a method of approach of society? Not to take us off the path too, too much, but how do we distinguish these two groups? Is it just the founding of America or throwing some tea in the water, what? No, I mean, I, the first thing to say, right, is that the, the, the land that we call America was, as I've said, it was, it was settled and, and established by European nations who were colonizing um, in, in America. And those, th those colonies that they established in America um, and let's take uh, America's 13 colonies, they were largely, they were English colonies. But of course, there were more than just Englishmen who were, who were or Britons who were living in the colonies. Uh, there, were, um, th there were Germans and there were Irish and there were um, uh, Frenchmen. Uh, I mean, th there were people from, from uh, all over Western Europe who, who, were, who were settling uh, in, in the colonies. But th the most important thing to understand is that European society at this time, which meant then colonial society, was very hierarchical in nature. And those societies did not understand and they did not recognize the concept of individual rights. They believed that society was, uh, that the concept society was a prefixed social entity and that within these social and the, within these social organisms, there were hierarchies. And the quotation you read to begin this uh, conversation with from George Fitzhugh says that there are some who are bound to rule and some who are bound to obey, right? That idea, which Fitzhugh would have written presumably in the 1850s, that idea really dominated um, almost all societies, not just European societies, but also African societies. 
at this time and societies all over the, the rest of the world. The idea that, that some men are bound to rule and some are bound to obey. And that, that, that philosophy, which had really dominated human history actually for several thousand years, going back at least to the Greeks and the ancient Egyptians, that, that moral political philosophy was exploded with the American Revolution. The Declaration of Independence smashed that philosophy. It smashed the philosophy uh, which, which said that men um, are, are a part of a, a high, what they called at the time a hierarchy of being. Um, with with rulers or masters on the one hand, and uh, and and at the at the very bottom of the spectrum, slaves. The Declaration, of course, famously says, "We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men, notice the word all, all men are created equal, and that they're endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, among which are the rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness." Those first two self-evident truths of the Declaration of Independence, which was, and the Declaration, it's important to note, was, as Thomas Jefferson once said of the Declaration, those self-evident truths were meant to be an expression, he said, of the American mind in the context of 1776. The single most important revolutionary document or the single most important revolutionary ideas, which eventually would put an end to slavery, were those exact words, yeah. right? It's the, the, it's the Declaration of Independence, I would argue, which more than any other statement, any other document in human history, began the process of ending slavery in the United States. And it it's, of course, it's the document which is the beginning of the United States, right? You cannot talk about 1619 as part of the United States of America. There was no United States of America in 1619. There was no United States of America in 1700 or in 1765. There's only United States of America beginning in 1776. So and the founding document of 1776, right? Yeah. Is an anti-slavery document. Now, uh, I love the picture you just painted here because I think it, it bridges us into our next, um, where we want to go with this so interestingly. But um, these, it, 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 some would seem that these documents, one, uh, and you can get into this, uh, are built on hypocrisy and contradictions. But more interestingly enough, um, I've, in my reading, I've noted that and others have noted that these documents sort of forced an argument. They forced a pro-slavery argument to happen. Almost one could say, and you could correct me on this, nowhere did such a moral and uh, explicit defense of slavery intellectually come into being until it was met with the opposition of the documents. So can you... Um, what, why did these documents force um, the thinking of these anti-slavery um, advocates, I mean, pro-slavery advocates to, to advance so much, especially when they were, if they were advocates of liberty during the revolution, were they not? Of course they were, absolutely. See, the thing is, um, colonial slaveholders did not view themselves as hypocrites through the 17th century and through the 18th century up until uh, 1765. It's only beginning in 1765 when Great Britain uh, and, and its parliament passes the, sh uh, the sh boat, first the Sugar and then the Stamp Acts and then all the other acts, the famous acts of British tyranny that, that passed in quick succession, uh, the Townsend Acts, the Tea Acts, the Course of Acts, et cetera, et cetera. It was only then when um, when American patriots um, viewed those actions of the British Parliament uh, as an attempt to enslave them, right? And they very openly and explicitly used the language 
uh, relative to these acts that were being passed by the of, by the British Parliament uh, as 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 tyranny and uh, uh, and and slavery. Um, that's how they understood what the British Parliament did. But then, like all the alarm bells started going off in their minds once they started saying. Uh, the Stamp Act is a form of tyranny and it's attempting to enslave us, then all of a sudden they realized, oh my gosh, if we can use the language of freedom and slavery relative to the actions that are being passed by the British Parliament, gee, you know, that same argument might apply to us, to us, um, colonial Americans as slaveholders. And so that was the moment. It, it was just shortly after 1765 when a few Americans started to realize, oh my gosh, we are in fact hypocrites, right? And with every passing year after 1765, the number of American patriots who, who woke up to that fact and started to see the hypocrisy of their own institutions, right? That was the moment, that was the first great awakening, you might say. And, and, and by 1776, many of them were painfully aware of their own hypocrisy and they, they wrote about it. Right. So um, in in chapter five of my my book, America's Revolutionary Mind, uh, not that one, uh, I guess the other one. The other. Too soon, too soon. Too soon. This there time. you go. That's the one. <laughs> Thank you. I like the publicity. Always. In chapter five of that book, I, I lay out the the extraordinarily pained arguments by people like Patrick Henry in Virginia and Thomas Jefferson who on the one hand, I mean, Patrick Henry, right? Give me liberty or give me death. And Thomas Jefferson, on the other hand, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. And yet these two men were slaveholders, right? But if you read their correspondence, for instance, uh, they were absolutely, and you see this particularly with Patrick Henry, he was absolutely tortured by the fact that he was himself uh, a slave owner and that the principles that he, the very principles that he was using against British tyranny could just as easily be used against him. And the same is true of Thomas Jefferson and, and, and many uh, of the other uh, revolutionaries. And, and, and there were some revolutionaries who, and we can talk about this in greater depth, there were some revolutionaries who, at the in the context of the time, gave up their slaves because of their own hypocrisy, which they could not live with. I was just about to ask, um, you know, some people may say, yeah, that's all good in theory. Their words are all nice. But what did they actually do about it? What did they actually they talk the talk? But did they they walk the walk in action to try and uh, solve this problem? Yeah, that's I was going to I was going to outline, you know, one of my favorite American revolutionaries that you presented in your book, Levi Hart. And his quote goes as the founding fathers have no right to claim that they're being enslaved by Britain if they're slaveholders. And I was going to do the exact same point I was just presented here. What were the founding fathers and the American revolutionaries uh, reaction and response to understanding this this deep contradiction that they held uh, intellectually? <sighs> Well, um, that's a hard question to answer. So some of them obviously recognized the hypocrisy and they did something about it. They freed their slaves. Uh, there were some uh, like Henry, Patrick Henry and Thomas Jefferson. And Jefferson, I think, is the, is, is the classic case who didn't free his slaves and uh, came to I think in many ways rationalize, and, and I mean that I mean this very much as a criticism, came to rationalizing all the reasons why he claimed not to have been able to free his slaves. Um, and I mean, the, just the story of Jefferson um, on the issue of slavery is a long and complicated story, and we could spend an hour just talking about Jefferson. 
But before we talk about Jefferson, let's just pause for a moment and consider the range of views that were held by American revolutionaries uh, at this time, right? So there wasn't one monolithic view uh, of, of what to do about slavery. And I mean, the question that Ibis has asked, I mean, that's the $64,000 question, uh, which is what, you know, if, if you claim to be opposed to slavery, um, what do you do about it? Whether you're a slave owner or a non-slave owner, what do you, what do, what do all Americans do about the question of slavery? All right. But to answer that question, you have to consider the context, the full context of views that existed at that time. And I, you know, there was, a, there was a range of views. I would say there were sort of four levels uh, of, of views. On the one hand, at one end of the spectrum, you had people like John Adams, for instance, who was opposed to slavery, morally opposed to slavery his entire life and never owned slaves. Then you get people like Benjamin Franklin and John Jay, one of the three authors of the Federalist Papers. Um, they had, they had, as younger men, they had formally owned slaves. Now they lived in the North. Uh, Franklin, of course, lived in Philadelphia. John Jay lived in New York City, and th th their they owned what would have been called at the time house slaves who effectively served as servants within within the home right so that kind of slavery though immoral was very very different from the kind of slavery you would get in the deep south for instance mm -hmm. um and yes they owned they owned slaves um they owned, you know, one or two house slaves, as they were called at the time, but they freed their slaves. And by, uh, by, the, by the 1770s and 80s, they also founded um, anti-slavery societies and then spent the rest of their, their lives, uh, Franklin in particular, fighting slavery tooth and nail. Third, you get to people like uh, for instance, George Washington, who was a major slave owner in Virginia. Um, but Washington freed his slaves in his will. I think it was on the death of his wife, he freed his slaves. So not great, um, but it at least it indicates that he recognized that slavery was immoral and that it should be abolished. And he eventually freed his slaves. And then you get the really hard cases, which we've already just talked about, namely people like Patrick Henry and Thomas Jefferson, who Ibis, as you said, talked the talk, but did not walk the walk. They, they were, they were um, anti, they, they were anti-slavery, both were anti-slavery in theory. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, if you read the letters of Thomas Jefferson or you, if you read Jefferson's comments in his notes on Virginia, it's absolutely clear that Jefferson believed that slavery was immoral and it was immoral precisely for the reasons contained in the Declaration of Independence, namely the rights uh, of, of the slaves are being violated in the worst way possible. So he recognized it was immoral and he was tortured by, by his own complicity with the institution of slavery. I think this but is in the end, Jefferson never freed his slaves. Right now. So the question is why, why did Jefferson not free his slaves? And, and I think that, I mean, in the case of Jefferson, it was be, it was and this, I want to be, I want to be very clear here. It was absolutely because of Jefferson's own moral failings. Jefferson um, lived beyond his financial means, and um, and so late in life, 
Uh, in fact, this is a very little known fact of Jefferson. In, in his final years, he was actually supported by the state of Virginia financially. Um, say, but, he had a ton of debt, I believe, in his he, houses. Exactly. Were, he, had, he, had a, he had a ton of debt based on uh, the building of Monticello, his home, and just because of the lifestyle uh, that, that he led. I think a bank even took ownership of his slaves, in fact. But, yeah. But I so, saw that. I was going to say this might be a great bridging point to kind of ideas that may have been shared with this idea of um, if we if we if we free slaves right now. Right. There was this fear. Some people uh, have even tried to bridge this into like some white general, you know, deterministic white fear that white people have uh, built up, which is completely not true. But of this idea of if we emancipate right now there's going to be a, a civil war on our hands. We're going to have, you know, fighting in the streets, uh, the more Southern pro-slavery side kind of view it as it will uh, deplore our society, kind of uh, ruin our neighborhood. Could you, so was this kind of behind Jefferson and them? And I kind of want to use this point to bridge into the, the pro-slavery uh, view of things. Yeah, without question. So this is what I call in chapter five of America's Revolutionary Mind, what I call the post-emancipation problem. And the post-emancipation problem is a real problem, right? And anybody who's going to think seriously about the question of slavery in the American founding has to think seriously and deeply about the post-emancipation problem, right? It's, it's cheap and easy uh, in the context of 2021 to, to talk about what any of us would have done about slavery in, in 1776, right? We can all play armchair abolitionist, but that's, that's, that, that's nothing. May, right? may I say, may I say to plug your, your lecture, you do a great, uh, exercise in part two of it, of this very question, having, dealing with the many different views. And one thing I'll say here, and maybe you could get more into, especially is the view of uh, violence and, um, and uh, abolitionism. And are we going to be violent abolitionists or, or not? Are we, are we going to use force to end this? So, or, yeah. Or so, but, go yeah. Politically or morally, I think there's a lot of different theories uh, that were presented in that lecture as well. Yeah. But in the latest, you know, go, well, I'll start with 1776, or I'll start with the founding period. And, and Jefferson, uh, Jefferson once famously said, uh, we have the wolf by the ears, the wolf being slavery. We have the wolf by the ears, and we don't know whether to hold on, that is to keep slavery, or, or let go. The fear is that if you let go, the wolf will bite you, right? And Jefferson made it very clear that, that his, I mean, his greatest fear it was that if you if you free the slaves here now today, then what, right? And Jefferson Jefferson claimed and that there would most likely be a race war, and he he also said by the way that justice would be on the side of the freed slaves in a race war. Wow, right? I didn't know that. But the fact of the matter is, however. Um, he also recognized that that slave the slaveholders or just whites generally living in areas where there was slavery would fight to to defend themselves. And of course, the problem was the problem from the perspective of freed slaves is that the whites had all the guns. Right. So in in the context of the founding period, I mean, here, and this is also important to note. So as I said at the very beginning of our conversation, 1776 is the single most important year for the eventual abolition of slavery, certainly in the context of the United States. It's the principles of the Declaration, which provide the moral impetus uh, and, and the, 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 the direction uh, for all anti-slavery people thereafter. But I mean, here, here are the issues. I mean, here, here are the challenges. Um, and there were, there were lots of different solutions that they were considering at the time. One was colonization, for instance, 
right? Establish colonies in, in Africa, like Liberia or in the trans Appalachian West, because the working assumption, at least among some people, certainly Jefferson, is that, is that it would be very difficult for freed slaves and former masters to live together in the same geographical area, in the same community. Especially at this time, property rights are, are still not even fully defined, uh, contracts. I'd imagine there was all types of uh, legal, legal issues and oh, practical it was comp- issues. Yeah, it was very complicated. And, that, and, and of course, that's premised on the idea that we can just wave our magic wand and free the slaves tomorrow. But of course, that's not how it works. You don't wave a magic wand. Right. There, there would have to be an entire legal process. And of course, one of the challenges is that the slaveholders who viewed their slaves as property would have demanded financial compensation. And the and there was virtually no financial compensation that that could have been raised, particularly from people who were who were non slave owners. I was about to say the moral implications of that. Yeah, the, I mean, there was an aversion to even being uh, forced uh, to capture slaves through laws. You know. They, yeah. So so here's what happened. Let, let's talk about what they actually happened, what they actually did based on the principles of the Declaration. Immediately after the Declaration was passed, every every state in the Union, the 13 states, had to develop constitutions. And in the North, between 1776 and 1803, every state north of the Mason-Dixon line either freed slaves via their constitutions or uh, through court cases, such as in Massachusetts, uh, uh, slavery was was outlawed in Massachusetts in the 1780s uh, through uh, through legal proceedings. And, and then thirdly, um, all of the other northern states passed laws, the state legislatures passed laws that abolished slavery over time. It was it was the principle was called gradual emancipation. Right. So from the moment a law was passed, they would say beginning in year X, Y, Z, anybody who has been held uh, as as a slave, once they reach the age of of 18 in the case of young women or 21 in the case of men, they would be free. Right. And so by 1803, slavery was abolished in all northern states. The other interesting thing to note is that as a result of the, the Declaration and the Revolution, there were um, there were a number, in fact, quite a few anti-slavery societies that were created in the South. Oh, uh, this may I note that uh, you said something in your uh, lecture or the lecture of the book that I found completely interesting. I don't remember the exact date, but you said before a certain time, the, the abolitionist movement, uh, I don't know if started in the South or was uh, largely based there until they got pushed out. Uh, which I thought was uh, it made perfect sense to me. Well, there, there. So, and let me just clarify one thing. So, there is no abolitionist movement in America, no formal official abolitionist movement, until 1831. Okay. Prior to 1831, what there was all over the United States were anti-slavery movements. And now, this is a there's a technical distinction between anti-slavery and abolition, right? So all, virtually all Americans who were opposed to slavery between 1776 and 1831 were anti-slavery uh, uh, proponents. And, and virtually all of them uh, accepted the principle of what was called gradual emancipation. Is this so, a Lincoln position? Said, What's that? Is this the, I'm sorry, is this the Lincoln uh, position, kind of position? Because I know uh, people often attack Lincoln for not being, he wasn't an abolitionist. He didn't really want to emancipate. Was he one of these gradual emancipators, these anti-slavery? So he wasn't a full abolitionist? So, correct. But so Lincoln was not an abolitionist 
in the way that someone like William Lloyd Garrison was an abolitionist. And Garrison was the great abolitionist. He founded the abolitionist movement in 1831 with um, the creation of the great uh, abolitionist uh, newspaper called uh, The Liberator. Lincoln, who comes much later, you know, Lincoln's political rise isn't until the, the 1850s. He was not an abolitionist, though he was, of course, radically anti-slavery. He was a gradual emancipationist in the sense that his, his, pol his core policy relative to slavery is that slavery should not extend west of the Mississippi. Leave slavery where it already exists, uh, and it will die a natural death over time. That, in a nutshell, is, is Lincoln's position. Now, going back to the founding period. So every northern state abolishes slavery. And then at the Constitutional Convention, uh, of course, um, uh, well, actually preceding the Constitutional Convention in the Continental Congress of 1786, the Northwest Ordinance is passed, which forbade the extension of slavery into the Northwest Territory, which includes the states of Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, Wisconsin, et cetera. So, and of course the constitution itself abolishes the international slave trade beginning in 1808. So there, so mo the view of most founding fathers was that slavery would die a natural death. Uh, and of course that the kibosh was put on that with the invention in the 1790s of the cotton gin, which allowed slave, which allowed slavery to once again become profitable, particularly in regions where it had not really been profitable. So um, the bottom line is, I mean, my bottom line is this, that the American Revolution and the principles which define the American Revolution were the single greatest cause in leading to the eventual abolition of slavery over time. Now, now this brings me um, to kind of the meat of our discussion here, I think. Uh, and I don't want to zoom past the point you made. You you told us about uh, kind of the constitutions of the North. Now, uh, on, on my own research and on uh, which stemmed from your book and your writings, uh, the statement that really stuck out to me is virtually all, if I'm not mistaken, all the slave states in the South, uh, they legitimized it through their constitutions legally. Uh, you can even... Um, do comparisons online and see the difference in the constitutions and where they made their, their edits and their points and uh, how it differed from the writing and the documents of, that you described. Um, so can we kind of get into the, the politics and I believe the term you use is the metaphysics of the anti-slavery uh, side and their kind of uh, political, how it, how it, it, it seemed that their, their real argument and uh, culture surrounding being pro-slavery uh, was very uh, statist, very collectivist. And um, can you kind of bring us into that? Yeah. So let me just say one last thing about the revolutionary generation. Despite the fact that there was this spectrum of views on what to do about slavery, Every single founding father was anti-slavery, as far as we know. And they considered slavery to be what they called, quote, a necessary evil. And I think the, the emphasis has to be not on necessary, but evil, right? The necessary was a practical problem, right? Morally speaking, it's evil, but it's necessary in the sense that we don't know how to get rid of it, okay? Now, let's fast forward to the 1830s. And as I said, William Lloyd Garrison founds the Liberator in 1831. And then in 1833, he founds the American uh, Anti-Slavery Society, which was an abolitionist society. So now the question is, what makes abolitionists different from uh, anti-slavery people, the anti-slavery people of the American founding, for instance? Well, 
Garrison and the and the and the abolitionists, their position can be summed up in their motto, which was immediate emancipation immediately begun. Right. So you can see how that contrasts against the idea of gradual emancipation. Now, so they 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 want to free the slaves, or at least the slogan is immediate emancipation, immediately begun. Right. So the, the their position is we absolutely oppose and condemn slavery as an institution, and we call for its immediate emancipation, but immediately begun. So they 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 weren't saying you know, we've got a magic wand and we can wave the magic wand and immediately abolish slavery. We want to begin. So if it's immediately begun, they want to begin the process of abolishing slavery here now today, recognizing the fact that, of course, you don't have a magic wand. You can't abolish it today or tomorrow. It will take X number of years in order to abolish slavery. Now, let me just say two really important things here. So at the heart of the radical abolitionist position of Garrison and his followers who were located in Boston was the idea of what they called moral suasion. And the doctrine of moral suasion says that the only legitimate way, the only sure way to abolish slavery and to deal with the post-emancipation problem is to change the minds and hearts, not only of slaveholders, but of all white Americans. They, they called for a kind of moral revolution that's in the minds and the hearts of the American people. And so the, the abolitionists, they, they began um, a, a, 